uh, I started to say good morning, but you might be viewing this in the evening, so whatever it is, hi, how you doing? <laughs> We're glad to see you. I'm glad you're seeing us. Uh, Daniel and I are working on a winter Bible study again this year. This year is the book of Ephesians, and uh, last night in prayer meeting, uh, we did kind of kick it off a little bit. Today's the 2nd of February, so last night first, uh, kicked off a little bit, and uh, we're going to uh, go on and start at verse 1, chapter 1 today. But before we do that, I brought something I want to show you guys. Daniel, hold on. Yep. It's kind of sandy-like because it's got sandstone in it. But if you folks can see these, uh, this one here is a church. That's a rose. Notice how beautiful that is. Um, I want you to, and I don't know if the definition is good enough, but if you notice, it's little pieces that have been placed together by the artist to build the overall picture of a church here and a rose over there. By the way, I was in Turkey as a missionary at one point, uh, attending meetings, not, not living there. And that's where these come from. A Turkish artist was making them and selling them in a hotel where I was at, and I bought them. And Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey, so I kind of thought, okay, that fits. But here's my point. If you notice the rose, if you notice the church, all the little pieces that are fit together by the artist, and you get this beautiful picture, that's really what the church of the body of Christ is supposed to be, the church that we are a part of. It's supposed to be that beautiful picture of all the little pieces fitting together, working together, producing something beautiful that glorifies God. And that's really what started off in the city of Ephesus when Paul was there and the founding of that church, and he was there for somewhere between two and three years. And they got off to a really good foundation, and it was a really strong, really good-looking church. And I'm not talking about the building, I'm talking about the people. But in the years as they passed, Something went wrong, began to go wrong in that church. And the letter that we're looking at to the Ephesians was written by Paul to both praise those people, but to also correct the things that were going wrong. The picture wasn't as pretty as it had been. All right? That's why I brought this, just kind of maybe think about it. So there is uh, some discussion about if you read some of the studies uh, about who wrote the book of Ephesians, I believe Paul wrote it. It says Paul right there in verse 1. But there are some people that say because of the, the style of the letter, that the way it was written, that maybe Paul didn't write it, but I believe he did write it. He just wrote it at a, a later time, a little more experience behind him and, and working with the churches. And, and that probably changed how he addressed the issues. Um, all of Paul's writings were collected around 90 AD. He remembered the early church did not have a Bible the way we have a Bible. So, so they would just get letters, writings from the various apostles and try to pass them around. But around 90 AD, all of the ones that were written by Paul were brought together. And those began to be circulated around. And this was with those. So that just, to me, fully points out that, yeah, the early church knew Paul wrote that letter. Okay, so that's just a little introduction there. He's to the church at Ephesus. If you want background on that group, go to Acts chapter 19. I think I'm right. And uh, Paul is there in Ephesus on his, uh, I believe, second missionary journey. And he spends two or three years there with them, teaching them and growing them and helping them. The people that he's addressing are coming out of a pagan background with multiple evil spirits and gods and things. And even in that part of the world today, you go over there, they've got something they call the evil eye. And you see it displayed in their artwork. And uh, it, there's a lot of superstition, even though today they call themselves Muslims, but there's a lot of superstition in Turkey about the evil eye. Mm. That paganist right. background is still there. So um, they, these are the people he's dealing with and uh, bringing them out of uh, where they might potentially offer sacrifices to multiple spirits or gods to, or goddesses to look for protection and trying to say, no, Jesus Christ died for your sins. He is the one true God. He is above all and, all, and, and over all, and this is all you need. And so that really gets us started with Ephesus. 
you want to? Yeah, so when I was thinking about this book and getting ready for this study, I thought when I've, I've preached through Ephesians, I've definitely taught passages out of Ephesians many times over the years. And yet I feel like almost every time I just, like, you know, you just, you're barely getting what's there. You're just getting a little tiny piece. And so what I wanted to do was try and teach it in a way uh, from a perspective that challenges us to consider to consider how the how the how this book applies to us, not just on the intellectual side, not just on well, this is the doctrine I believe, or this is I believe this doctrine or whatever, but on the integral side of this is how it applies to my life today, and this is what is um, touching me. And so, when we think about this book, I wanted to remind us a couple of things to add to what Clint was saying about the introduction. You know, by the middle of the first century, Rome had under its rule Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Cyrene, Gaul. In Spain, North Africa, and Armenia. Now, if you translate that into a map of today, that's going to look like Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, which is where Ephesus is at, Greece, Albania, Bulgaria, Croatia, Slovenia, Austria, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, and Britain. It's a lot. Yeah. Now, some of those North African countries. It, they we, Rome didn't have have influence all the way into the country, all the way inland into the country, but they had an influence, especially on the coastal area around the Mediterranean. They had the populated sea. areas because yes. the southern part of those countries is the Sahara Desert. Right, and and the populated areas are centered around the Mediterranean right. Sea, and so Rome had control over over this area, and it, we often refer to that as the known world. And uh, so, and as you think about that, there was a. a line that I read uh, from N.T. Wright on his commentary just you know talking about the times of the New Testament New Testament time periods and he made this statement he said Rome had an empire before it had an emperor and so I said well that what does that mean and so I went to research it you know and they had they had built up this empire over a couple of hundred years through these Republican states yeah. um, these different states they had taken over the Grecian world and then they had the Grecian culture had attached themselves to the Roman the Roman military as they moved throughout the world and so they kind of became hand in hand there to some degree. Um, but Julius Caesar was the original Caesar and he was actually not even an, empire, an emperor. Uh, he was declared dictator for life. Well, when he died it became a three-way three civil war and ultimately his adopted son uh, became the first emperor and his declaration was that he had brought peace to the world. Now, when you hear that statement and you hear Paul's statement over and over that Jesus Christ brings peace to the world, the end of the ages has come, the Son of God, all of those were direct statements that the Caesar had attributed to himself. And so Paul takes those statements and puts them out there and gives them for us. And so when you think about that, when you read Ephesians, as I hope you'll do, you need to read it within the context of what Paul is pushing back against within the society. First of all, the paganism that's just absolutely rife because they, they worshipped whatever it was that their culture had adopted over the years. Um, and then the overlordship of Caesar. Everybody had a bow to Caesar, and you had to call him. So uh, each Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. They worship Artemis, which was the Greek god, uh, if you read Ephesians and if you read in Acts 19, as you were talking about, that goddess is referred to as Diana. So Diana was the name for the Roman god, which was the twin or the, the mirror image of the Greek god Artemis. And so they would take and, and blend their gods together. Um, I want you to think about this for just a minute as we, before we jump into this next passage. The temple that they worshipped at okay, had been there for 300 years when Paul showed up. And if you go read Acts 19, you read about the riot that took place, and you read about what was happening. Paul was challenging 300 plus years, and by the way, it was more the temple had been around for longer than that, but this was the rebuilt temple. Um, the temple itself had been around in existence for about 600 years, and the rebuilt temple had been there for 300 years when Paul showed up, and it lasted for another 300 years before it was ultimately destroyed by the Goths. Mm. And so, these people had a deep ingrained history in how you went about life and how you did things. And so when you look at this statement here, and, and I'm going to look at it here starting in verse 3, it says, 
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. One of the things that is happening here as you read what Paul is saying is he was challenging their understanding of what life was about. Yeah. He was challenging Caesar. And I want you to picture this for just a minute, okay? King Jesus, he said, and, and Paul refers to Jesus so many times as King Jesus, but King Jesus has chosen us before. Now, our minds immediately go to the intellectual side of, well, what does this mean? How does this work out in the whole world? Who was chosen? How were they chosen? But Paul's writing to the group of Ephesus, and I'm just going to imagine he's writing not only to them, but to everybody who is then going to be under the circulation of his letter because he knows how this is going to work. Mm -hmm. So listen to what he says. You were chosen before. Now think about what they were chosen before. All right, They were chosen before they performed. Okay, When the Romans came into an area and took over an area, you could become a Roman citizen. You could if you paid a hefty sum. Yeah. You either paid with your life or you pay with your money. Uh, in fact, if you remember Paul's conversation with the Berean captain, I think it's in Acts chapter 22, um, he says, I'm a Roman citizen, I'm a free man. And uh, the Roman, the captain, and Paul says, I was born free. And the captain responds to him with, a, with almost an air of regret. He says, it's with a great price that I have purchased my freedom. There's just, you know, we read that in just a simple, oh, it's a statement. No, this man was calling out what he had lived through to become this Roman citizen. And he was doing that for the sake of his family and his future generations. But So Paul is saying to them, there are people reading this letter who are not Roman citizens. There are people who are reading this letter that are. And Paul is saying, King Jesus chose you before you performed. That is in direct contradiction to King Caesar, who only chose you if you were able to do what Caesar wanted you to do. Yeah. And so, man, Paul is flying straight in the face of 300 plus years of pagan worship coupled with this emperor deity. And, and we're going to get to that a little bit more in just a minute um, as we look at it. But here's the thing, and I, I think I have it here. I want to, yes. I want us to understand this from our perspective because everybody worshiped these pagan gods and goddesses. Mm -hmm. But the ultimate god was Caesar. And Caesar was the ultimate God because he chose whether you lived or died. Yeah. And only did he choose whether you lived or died. He chose the way that you lived and died. He chose your, your ethnic situation he, because he designated that. His rule did. And so these were people, they were born into whatever they were born into. They felt trapped by it um, or empowered by it. And Paul said, no, 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 no. You were chosen before that. Not only were you chosen before you performed, you were, you were chosen before you were ethnically divided. So you had the Romans who were born Romans, and then you had the Romans who were Roman citizens because they had purchased their citizenship as an outsider. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, and then only that, you were chosen before you were sexually divided. Women in that era and time had little power compared to the men. Right. And if they had any at all, it was because they were extremely wealthy um, or because they had become very high in the ritualistic cultic worship that happened in some of these uh, temples, which were... Um, horrific places, uh, in, at least from the concept that you and I can imagine of what life is like. So he says, King Jesus chose you before. That is a direct contradiction to Caesar. And by the way, that's a direct contradiction to how we live today. Because we still choose people based on their performance, mm -hmm. based on their colors, based on their ability to blend in with us, based on their ability to whatever. And Paul's statement is emphatic. That no, no, no. King Jesus chooses before um, and so that is an encompassing statement it's a huge statement it's a big statement um, and he follows that up by saying he chose you to sonship to be an actual adopted son for his pleasure and so the reality of what he's saying here is he's not only saying that King Jesus chose you before but he is saying that he chose you to be his son for his pleasure uh, and then once again this is a pushback at the idea and mentality of that culture and time, and, and once again, it's, it's pushed back at our culture because we still deal with this. Um, Caesar chose you for what you could give him. Okay, Jesus chose us for what he could give us. 
Uh, those are two completely contradictory realities. And that hasn't changed. We still choose people for what they can give to us. And God still chooses us based on what he can give to us. And so um, this is just a, a, a beautiful picture um, of what it means. And, you know, we still have a tendency to treat the person who makes the laws as if they are the ultimate entity. Um, as they're the ones that we have to court. They're the ones that we have to have power with. They're the ones that we have to see. And Paul is completely pushing out of back that out back on that in verses uh, 3 through 10 as he just brings all these things out. Um, he says in verse, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Freely given versus Caesar. Versus Caesar who gives because he has an expectation. Yeah. And by the way, we still have that expectation today. So, yes, we could take this passage of Scripture, and, and some of us know the different levels of uh, arguments and intellectual discussions and comparisons to other parts of Scripture. Um, but I wanted us to try to get a picture of what that meant to a person in Ephesus. Now, think about the, the man and his wife and their children. Maybe it's a, a, a family of two or three children. He's not a Roman citizen. He's, he's living uh, in Ephesus. He, his life is relegated to physical labor, hard physical labor. Yeah. His wife is also physically laboring. His children, he knows that his children are going to grow up. They're going to fall into the same position that he is. They're always going to be a level under whatever the lowest level of Roman citizenship is. Um, by the way, there was over five levels of Roman citizenship. And Paul's pushing back at that too because we're going to look at that in just a minute because he talks about unity. But um, he's put these people, they know this is our life. And Paul's saying, no, 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 that's not your life. Your life is more than that because King Jesus chose you and he chose you freely. No expectation, nothing on your part. Um, <clears throat> it says, and, and then he goes on to explain that. You have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us and so he jumps into this and then he then he begins to uh well before i jump into the next part do you have any anything there? i'm going a little faster no no I? you're fine uh um i was thinking that you were talking about the family life and that time period those kids as soon as they were old enough to do any kind of manual labor if they were you know if they'd had the need in the family for food for money they would put that kid with the blacksmith or with the the mason and he would be working just yeah. like his daddy and you know their mindsets to some degree were a little bit like ours if we're not careful the angling you know well i'm only this but can i get my kid to this level right. Right. and then if my kid gets to this level might their kid get to this level and maybe in four generations we've we've become roman citizens and and there's hope for my family um, or the opposite of that, the people that just say there's no hope for us, there's oh, nothing we can do. There's nothing in our American lifestyle that really compares to the time period and the situation you're talking about. But uh, you and I were talking the other day about the, the new uh, video, I guess it's called video series, television series, yeah, The Chosen. Yeah, the chosen. chosen. Mm -hmm. But if you notice in that thing, those Romans, they're like, I can kill you right now. They look at one of these Jews and it's like, I can kill you right now. Nobody will care. Yeah. You know, we'll just drag your body out and throw it on, and I'll call the next guy in. You know, and in our society, we don't function that way. We don't. We've never functioned that way. But, but that's how bad it was for the people that were not Roman citizens. Yeah, and and so then you take that and you attach it to a family that's living in a home, right? And it's not a good home, but it's a home, and they're working, and they hear, okay, there's another Roman legion coming to town. Okay, how many of them are bringing their families with them? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if they bring, if there's 300 of them show up with their families, are we going to get evicted from our home that we have no rights to yeah. because this guy and his family show up and say, well, or are they going to let us stay in the corner of the house and become their servants? And become their slaves, basically. Yeah, but still be expected to maintain our own lifestyle, um, but still provide for them. And so, uh, you, like you said, there's just, for us, there's just not a visual picture of what was happening in that time period. Um, for, for maybe you and I, down here in the South where we've, we, you know, we're able to work, we're able to move. Maybe if you got more into a, um, an inner city where people just felt locked in, um, 
about a year and a half ago, I went to a um, conference over in Valdosta, and the lady was sharing about Albany, Georgia. Albany, Georgia is not a big city in, in comparison. But she's talking about Albany, Georgia, and there's a 12-block area in Albany, and I wish I could remember the name of it, and I cannot. But she said they have ministered to women that have never been outside of that 12-block area of their entire lives. That's real poverty situation. Yes. Yeah. High poverty, um, high sex trafficking, high drug trafficking, um, you know, all sorts of, uh, all of the yeah. things you think of when you think of true inner city. And, and they've problems. never been out at 12 Never block. been outside of the wow. 12 block here. So there was a couple of ladies, um, and this lady, one of the ladies that they were ministering to was very young. She had a 12-year-old child, and they had gotten this 12-year-old child in an after-school program, and they were talking about how that, you know, this woman told them that she had never been outside of that. Now, could she have potentially as a kid and never realized it or remembered? Yeah, sure. I mean, but the reality of it is her known world was wrapped in right those there. 12 blocks. So you go taking this message to somebody like that, and no, 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 can't be. The rich people come down here and do to me what they want to do to me. You know, the dealers come down here and do what they want to do to me. I have no say in this matter. Yeah. All I'm doing is trying to survive. Um, and this is what he's, he's, he's talking to. Well, Paul's teachings in that time period were uh, absolutely revolutionary. I mean, it's it's like walking up to somebody today and saying, hey, do you want to float in the air? I can yeah. make you yeah. float in the air. And they'd be like, no way. You know, and, you know, it's just it, total, total, complete, 100% change in the way you look at life. Yeah, and, and then he, so he brings this in, and now he doubles down on it. Because then he talks about this mystery. Um, verse 9, he says this. Well, let me pick up in the middle of verse 8. He says, with all wisdom and good and understanding, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Okay, maybe you get some people to say, all right, all right, I was born into nothing, I have nothing. There is a God, and they probably still would have begun to think of him as a little G. There is a God out there that's bigger than Caesar, and he's he loves me. Now, all okay, this is transforming their mind, they're beginning to, okay. And then Paul says, oh, by the way, and this God is bringing all into unity. So not only are you transformed out of your non-citizenship role into a full identity in Christ, but the Roman citizen is also transformed into a full identity with Christ. And by the way, y'all are going to be friends. Y'all are going to be co-worshippers. Y'all are going to come together. And, and it's, it's mind-blowing. It's even mind-blowing to today because... If you go look at churches today, and a lot of times, and I'll be very careful how I say this, the churches that are deemed, quote-unquote, successful churches, and you take pictures, what you see is identical. Uh -huh. You see a very homogeneous look. It's a very singular look. And I'm not picking on that. I'm just telling you. And those people are bound together as much by their culture and their, stat their status in society, their socioeconomic status, Probably as they are Christ. Now, some of them certainly go past that and become bound in Christ. But a true church is 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 to mirror as as Clint. You see the colors in this mosaic, you know, multicolored, multi-part, and not just multicolored in skin color. But I'm talking about the dimensions right. of who is there, and and even their beliefs, and to some degree, even their willingness to just struggle through it with other believers um, and commit together, and so. He brings this together, and he's, he does this. And so now this is kind of a celebration, and he ends it on a high note. And I'm going to give a little bit here, and Clint's going to take the rest of it as we finish up this first chapter. But he starts, and he just he tells them all these things, lists all these things, and then he starts praising them. And the picture I have is of a coach that at the end of a ball game takes, him, takes this player, and he puts his arm around him, and he says to the cameras or the people that are present there, this guy, he struggles, he commits, he plays hard, he focuses, uh, he gives a great effort in the game. And now, if you're sitting there watching and you're thinking, yeah, and he blew it on such and such a play and this, that, and the other, because we're seeing it from the loss. But Paul's got his arm around him, and that's how he starts out in verse 19. He says, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in Lord Jesus and your love for God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you and my prayers. 
And then he says, And I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And he keeps on praying. So he's got his arm wrapped around him, and he's just blessing him. And then he kind of turns it yeah. and directs it in, in a different direction. I'm going to let Clint pick okay, up. Okay, I'm going to back up just a second. And I did not do this when I taught on this last night at prayer meeting. But look back at the end of verse 13 and verse 14 just before the mm-hmm. verse 15 where he was reading. Because here's something. Now, all these various gods that we yeah. worship back at that time period, they were pretty fickle. You know, it's like, okay, they might bless me today or they might kill me today. I don't know. You yeah. know I'm going to do the best I can to make them happy. And so whatever possible idea of salvation they might have had, it was all up in the air, not really sure about it kind of thing. So Paul comes in preaching this King Jesus who changes everything. And he says, and by the way, when you begin to follow him, when you truly commit your heart to him, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our hand. In other words, you can't lose that salvation yep. once you mm-hmm. get it. Yep. That's revolutionary right there. Mm-hmm. Caesar would love you today. And praise you, yep. and tomorrow send his send right hand man yep. in there to cut your head off, or or lend you know conscript you into the army. And yeah, you out of time. yeah. Take everything you got, and you're gone. Yep. You know? So, verse fifteen, where he just read, he is praising them. Now, we don't know, but we can suppose Paul has been gone. I think somebody said wrote that he'd been gone about ten years from this church at the time he wrote this. We believe he's in prison in Rome when he wrote this because over in chapter 6 he talks about being in change but uh, he's been getting reports over the years about Ephesus church because like a good church planner you always keep track of the churches you start trying to anyway and uh, and so he's here and he's here and he's began to see okay yeah they're really great in some ways but like you said there's other issues got to be addressed and he begins to do that right here and uh, verse 17, he is, he is there. He's, he's talking about how great they are and all of that. He says, I pray uh, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of wisdom. All right. Now, again, I want to push this point. These people did not have a bound copy of Scripture the way we have it right now in our lives. They, they couldn't run jerk it off the shelf and say, what did Jesus say about so-and-so? What did God say about so-and-so? Right. They couldn't do that. So they needed spiritual wisdom. And the next part, revelation and knowledge of him. Revelation was huge in early Christian church. The work of the Holy Spirit was huge. He had to teach them because they didn't have this you know, written out the way we do. So this is huge, but then... There are three things mentioned, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of us. That you may know phrase to me is really big. You see it again over in 1 John. It said these things are written, so that you may know, that you may know, that you know, that you know, like those old Baptist preachers used to preach, that you know, you know, you know, you know that you're saved. Security of the believer, all right? Don't doubt. Yes, Caesar can change his mind and cut your head off an hour from now. Yes, volcano erupt and half the city wiped out. Yes, all kind of stuff can happen. That doesn't mean God has cast you off. You are still at one with him. Don't doubt that. And uh, it goes on down and says, uh, what is hope of this calling, which is salvation? What, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, his blessings, and what a blessing we are to him and him to us, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? We don't talk about power in our Baptist mm-hmm. churches. We, we, get too, we start thinking charismatic right, right. and stuff. Yep. We run away from that kind of stuff. I get reports all the time because I'm still involved heavily in mission work. I get reports all the time. I read stuff all the time about God showing his power here and there in different places. You know, uh, it, it, you, you hear of people's lives literally saved physically, but you also hear of God through his power just arranging things so that people hear the gospel and get saved 
And it's almost, you think, how in the world would that ever even happen? How did the gospel get from here to here so that that person could get saved? It just doesn't, you can't imagine how God could work, but through his power, he can do that. You, we, we hear reports a lot of times of, uh, of people who are healed. Uh, a dead man resurrected over on the East Africa coast during the burial service. <laughs> and, and people are like, no, he wasn't really dead. Yeah, he was dead. It was verified. He was dead. <laughs> Fortunately, they didn't do an autopsy on him. They just wrapped him up and put him on a uh, coffin thing, and he woke up. Uh, but, you know, God's power is real. And Paul is trying to point out to these people, once you're saved, you're not going to lose it. God is powerful. He's, and he goes on and talks about the power of God in these next few verses. But again, he's, he's having to come back against something that's starting to happen in the Ephesian church. And even in Revelation, you find a reference to this, but I, we won't go there today. But um, when I was a missionary, I would often go to a, a person's house and be standing around talking. And we learn to search the house with our eyes as we would talk to these people. And they may claim to be Christian. Some of them possibly even, you know, taking up the offering at church, teaching Sunday school, doing, doing things, leaders in the church. But as you're sitting there and visiting and looking around, even as you walked up to the house, you're kind of looking up under the eaves of the house without making it obvious. You're just looking. And sooner or later, you spot this little animal skin bundle of sticks all wrapped up together. It's a little strings and stuff hanging out. And then you know, he's been to the witch doctor and bought protection against witches. And that's what that little thing is. It's stuck up in a crack of the ceiling that nobody notices. He, he, he's trying to cover all his bases. Maybe mm -hmm. God's not as powerful as yeah. we say he is. Yeah. You know, he's trying to cover. And the, F, the church at Ephesus, these are the sorts of things, influences that had come into the church. Why and how, I don't know. I read some stuff. Some people said it was done on purpose to make the church more appealing to the local pagans. That doesn't make sense, but that's what somebody wrote. Um, I don't know how it happened. Maybe just people got in church who were religious but not truly saved and corrupted the teachings of the church. I, I don't know. But that's a sort of thing that Paul is beginning to come against here. So you go on down in this section, and uh, for the sake of time, I won't read all this, but from 19 all the way down to verse 23, the last verse of chapter 1, he is saying, Christ is more powerful than everything. It's all wrapped up. And the last note I made on my Wednesday night thing was, we win with Christ. Yeah, That's it. There is nobody more powerful. There's no influence more powerful. We are secure in him. Yes, maybe he doesn't protect us physically all the time. Sometimes he lets us walk into the trouble and things happen, but he walks with us always through that.